Hello, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. So in this presentation, I'm going to look at basically at, yeah, I mean, the title says it all really. How do we get heaps of spheres on the screen? I'm not going to be a tease, so I'll just insert the demo here. Okay, so here's the final result. I'll just give this up front, give this a shot. There we go. In this scene, we have 64 spheres and this is operating as a path tracer, so basically it's going to keep rebounding up to a hundred times, I think, until it hits the sky. So at the moment we have about 2400 frames per second. Nice. And if we were to run this same thing in Python as an apples to apples comparison, this is a little different, I guess, because there's a plane in there but not that much different. Here we also have 64 spheres doing up to 100 bounces, and it's going 1300 frames per second, which it actually blows my mind that Python is even, Python with OpenGL is even anywhere close to this performance. But yeah, there we have it. And that's basically what we're gonna be looking at. So to do this, I've broken it down into a number of steps, a number of questions, if you will. First situation is how can we ray trace an arbitrary number of spheres? Okay, that's algorithmic in the shader. Then how can we represent the spheres in memory? And then how can we transfer those spheres from our scene, basically from our CPU to our GPU? And then I'm gonna have a little bit of a look at performance and a little bit of a discussion on strategies. So first up, how do we deal with a whole bunch of spheres? So on this screenshot here, we can see basically that we modify our hit record struct so that we also keep track of the last sphere, which was hit successfully. And we also keep track of the color, which has been, has been gotten so far, basically. Then we have a number of, of steps. So we have this hit test, which will test against a sphere. And then let me go right down the bottom, right down the bottom, we have this color. So that's where it all starts. So we say, we've got this ray. We want to work out what color should go on that pixel on the screen. Basically that will test the hit against all of the spheres. And then depending on whether we hit or don't, we'll either scatter the ray, which will update the color on the hit record and update the ray, or we might hit the sky. And I'll talk through that a little bit more. So here we are to link this to the, the code in the GitHub repo. This is in the, uh, what is it? That's right, stage one, the host visible buffer. Although the ray tracer compute shader will be the same for all of these. So we just go into this uh, ray tracer and I wanna talk about basically how we handle spheres. So. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, but yeah, I mean, there it is. That's the sphere struct. We have this hit record that we see, just as I was describing in the presentation. Um, but then we have these functions. Oh yeah, and we'll talk about this later on, but basically we have a buffer of spheres. Okay, so we have this hit function, which is right, right down to hit. And this hit function is pretty much doing the standard sphere ray trace. The only big difference is that instead of passing in a sphere object that I'm going to work with, I'm going to pass in a sphere index. And this isn't really that interesting, but basically it's just um, to lower the memory bandwidth. Because if we work in terms of uh, integers rather than structs, we're passing around less memory. Um, and the other big thing is instead of returning a hit record, we're actually just taking a reference with this in out keyword as this comes from just standard GLSL. So yeah, I mean, it's a standard function we go through. And if we find out that we have actually hit something, then we just update the hit record and then return. Otherwise specify that this latest hit was not in fact successful. So that's great. Um, but then we have this scatter function and I'm trying to modularize this a little bit so we can fix it up later on. But basically we go and we hit things and then we have the sphere index field of the hit record has been set with the index of the last valid sphere that we hit. 
So then we pass in here and we, of course, unpack that sphere. And then we do the regular calcula calculation to find out where in space we hit and what normal we hit. As you may know from standard ray tracing, the normal vector is equal to the direction vector from the center of the sphere out to the point where it was hit. Um, then we just go ahead and reset this ray object. So we set its direction and its origin. Ah, oh, did I forget to set that? That might explain a lot. Okay, just give me one second. That should be easy enough. All we need to do is basically update the ray origin. I can't believe I missed that. There we go. I mean, that that looks more accurate. Okay. Ah. <laughs> there you go. I mean, I just wasn't expecting that. Okay, cool. Right, so there we have it. That is how the scatter function works. It basically just updates the hit record with the new color and reorients the ray to go and and trace again. And then we have this background color. This background color function essentially just gives the, the sky color. And we could tint this according to the ray's direction to simulate like a gradient or something. That's pretty common. But yeah, I mean, there we have it. Okay, that's great. And then this all comes together in the color function. So here we just set up a hit record, give it a sensible initial state, and then we just keep going a hundred times or until we hit the sky. And then for each time we trace along, update the state, and yeah, by the end of um, by the end of that trace, basically we perform the appropriate action. As you can see here, if we haven't hit something, then we'll be getting early exit out of that loop. But yeah, that's how tracing works with multiple spheres. But that's basically how it goes. So then we need to think about memory layouts. So it's a great idea to reduce or minimize the amount of memory that we're using so that our structs don't get too big because lots of memory usage is never great. So here's what I've got for the sphere. For the sphere, I'm gonna store it with a VEC3, so X, Y, Z for the position of the center, then the radius, that's one more float, and then why not a VEC for RGBA for a total of 32 bytes. Then for the, uh, to get the number of spheres, I could pass that in as an individual number, like a push constant or something, but why not bundle it along with the camera description? So I'm gonna make what's called scene parameters. And here in this description, you can see that I have um, the forwards, right, up, and position of the camera. Now for the forwards, right, and up, I'm gonna have potentially four floats, but only the first three floats are actually used for the vectors. We have a VEC3 and then implicit padding. Okay, fair enough. I'm, I'm sure you can see how this sets out. And then we have the scene. The scene has 64 spheres, which would be about two kilobytes of memory, and scene parameters is 64 bytes. Okay, fair enough. On the right-hand side, we have first up how we handle it in memory, in the shader, sorry. And then down below, we have how the scene will handle it on the CPU. So in the shader, hopefully you should be able to see how these structs map to the diagram on the left. And we also have a buffer of spheres. Okay, fair enough. And then in the scene, we have that sphere struct, which again is pretty similar to the shader. I think it's it's very similar. And then we have the scene description, and this is really important. I need to take care of the memory alignment so that the alignment on the CPU, the C++ struct, matches the alignment on the um, GPU. So I'm just being really explicit there. But yeah, let's jump in, have a little look at that. So here we are back in the code, and we are going to have a look at the object representation. So here you can see that basically these two will stitch together and take up the size of a VEC4, as will this one. And so we have this sphere struct, it's nicely packed together. It is using up eight vectors, oh no, eight floats, or in other words, what, 
256 bytes? A bits. What am I? I'm losing it. I'm losing it. 64 bytes, of course. Um, right, so we have that sphere, and then we have this buffer of spheres, which is sitting there as binding number one. Okay, no problem. And we also have, yeah, uniform buffer object. Very exciting. Have a look at the code if you want to see more details, but essentially we can just read this stuff off. So as we can see here, we are reading off, seem to be finding more and more issues with my code. In theory, it shouldn't make a difference from memory. I think I did have those defaults, but let's verify that. Yeah, there we go. That looks like what I would expect it to. Okay. Excellent. So great. No problem. How do we deal with that? Well, just as I put in the screenshot, the code shot, we have this scene object and Okay, so where was I? Right, so the scene manages all this stuff and we can see in the constructor that, well, pretty much we randomize a bunch of spheres, create them, set in all the data that we need for the description. And there we have it. Now when it comes, and then finally we have the process of getting all this stuff into the scene. So the diagram on the left hopefully makes sense. We start with the scene and we go to render it. So a pointer to the scene gets passed to the engine. So the engine can have access to all the data that is in the scene. We mem copy that onto a CPU visible buffer, host visible. Okay, fair enough. And those buffers are bound as descriptions to a frame. So this is where it gets a bit funky. So the engine selects a frame that it wants to render to and mem copies the relevant data onto the buffers, which are then bound because they're descriptor sets, or they're in the descriptor set for the frame. On the right here, we can also see a description of the buffer object. I took my previous buffer object and abstracted it. So it's more of a managed memory object, if that makes sense. So we have the ability to split to it, really. That's the big one. So that'll essentially just do a mem copy. Okay, so what is the cost of a naive full update? Well, let me just do a demo of that. So how bad is it? <clears throat> oh, how bad is it to actually do one of these global memory transfers, one of these mem copies every frame? Here, before I go and dispatch my ray tracing job, I go ahead and blit everything over to the buffer, or both buffers actually. Here we can see that the performance is, let's say, 2200 frames per second. Okay. And if we don't do this, because remember, everything is set up once in the beginning and it never changes, so we can get away with this, then performance is about the same. About, oh, a little more, actually, 2300 frames per second. Now, this actually surprises me that it's not more dramatic and... Personally, I believe that the performance bottleneck is actually in the ray tracing algorithm and not in the memory. But I do believe that when we get an acceleration structure on this, that the speed differences will be accentuated. It'll be more obvious. With that in mind, is there anything we can do to improve performance? Well, one thing is we could use device local memory with a staging buffer in between. Of course, that'll speed things up. Um, but then the other case is, do we even have to do a naive full update? Or can we have a sparse update? So in other words, the I believe the update buffer or something function in Vulkan can take multiple um, update ranges. And so it's possible to update a buffer in that way. It's also possible to update a buffer with a compute shader. So simply write directly to it without even using a staging buffer. Well, no, yes, using a staging buffer, I just correct myself, but without using the update function. And then the other option is to 
basically do a, a weaving system. So we dispatch the compute, uh, compute shader for a frame, and that's doing its thing, that's working in the background. But the CPU is still free to do whatever we want it to. So while that is happening, we can then do some mem copy or something. I played around with that. I had issues getting the synchronization to work. And the, what will I say? The um, performance hit didn't even seem too bad doing a mem copy every frame anyway. But um, yeah, that's it. I'll just have a, a pop up. You know, how does this work with a device local buffer? So then what is the benefit of using a faster memory type? Well, it's not no benefit. There is some benefit. Let's compare. This is basically the whole thing just coded up again using a device local memory for the buffers. Fire this up and we've gone from 2300 frames per second to 2400, close to 2500. This is just updating once at the beginning of the program and not updating continually. It's a, oh, 2500, nice. It's a pretty valid question to ask what happens what is the cost of continually updating? Because now it's not just a single mem copy, but it's also a mem copy to a staging buffer and then an internal copy. So let me just code this up now. There we go. So here we grab our stuff. Let's go ahead and prepare that frame. So this is the absolute worst, most naive implementation. And it's bad. It's horribly bad. So this is the, the, um, the trade-off. Clearly this is not how it should be done. But then the question is, is there a way to mitigate that? I don't know. That's, that's an open question, but look, I just want to emphasize something currently redo that. Currently, we were getting about 2,500 frames per second, 24, 25. It's pretty nice. That was in debug mode. So logic dictates that if we switch this over to release mode, and then we go over to, where is it? The initializer of the engine and switch off validation layers, then this is essentially going full throttle. So we should see something crazy. As a matter of fact, we do see something crazy. And the crazy thing is that we haven't really improved performance. Even though in earlier cases, I could get performance doubling or maybe not doubling, but really going up by switching off validation layers. And what this is indicating to me is that the program is probably GPU bound. In other words, the performance bottleneck is not the CPU. It's not the Vulcan calls with their overhead introduced by validation layers, but it's actually happening in the GPU. And so in conclusion, what I want to do in the next stage is implement a acceleration structure, get that going fast, and then see how these little changes begin to affect performance. All right. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation and I will see you again soon. Have a good one. Bye.